from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning. Welcome to the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. My name is Janice Hyde, and I am privileged to serve as the interim director of the Kluge Center. Before we begin today's program, please take a moment to silence your cell phones and other electronic devices. I see everybody reaching. Thank you. I'll also make you aware that today's program is being filmed for placement on the Kluge Center website, as well as its YouTube and iTunes channels. We are also live tweeting this event, so if you would like to tweet or retweet or just join the Twitter conversation, please do so using hashtag LifeEmerges. The John W. Kluge Center is pleased to host today's symposium, The Emergence of Life on the Earth, in the Lab, and Elsewhere, which has been organized and will be led by Dr. Nathaniel Comfort, who is the Bloomberg NASA Library of Congress Chair in Astrobiology. The Kluge Center is a vibrant center for scholarly research on Capitol Hill that brings together individuals from around the world to exchange ideas and learn from one another, to distill wisdom from the library's rich resources, and to interact with policymakers and the public. The center offer, offers opportunities for senior scholars and postdoctoral fellows to do research using the unparalleled collections of the Library of Congress. It offers free public lectures, conferences, symposia, and other programs, and it administers the Kluge Prize, which recognizes outstanding lifetime achievement in the humanities and social sciences. To view past programs or to learn more about the Kluge Center, please visit our website at loc.gov slash Kluge. The Bloomberg Chair in Astrobiology is a result of what has been a unique and rewarding collaboration between NASA and the Library of Congress. It's ta it takes its name from Nobel Prize winner Baruch Berry Bloomberg, founder of the NASA, NASA Astrobiology Institute and a founding member of the Library of Congress Scholars Council. Dr. Bloomberg envisioned the creation of a chair in the Kluge Center that would focus on the humanistic and societal impacts of astrobiology. Nathaniel Comfort is the third person to hold the Bloomberg chair, and I am delighted to say that the two previous chair holders David Grinspoon and Stephen Dick, as well as the incoming chair, Luis Campos, are all with us today. And please note that we are currently accepting applications for the 2017-2018 chair. As I hope any of the past chairs will tell you, this is a fantastic opportunity to spend a year of research, reflection, and writing at the Kluge Center. The application is available on our website, and the submission deadline is December 1st. So please consider applying yourself or encouraging others to do so. It has been a true pleasure to have Nathaniel with us at the Kluge Center this year. He spent his time examining the history of the genomic revolution in origin of life research. Dr. Comfort is a professor in the Department of the History of Medicine at Johns Hopkins University. He has published several books and scores of articles, including his book, The Science of Human Perfection, How Genes Became the Heart of American Medicine. He has written for The Atlantic, The Nation, The New York Times Book Review, among others. His blog is Genotopia, Dot scienceblog.com, and he tweets from at NC Comfort. Before Nathaniel takes the stage to launch today's program, I would like to invite Dr. Mary Wojtek, the Senior Scientist for Astrobiology at NASA, to the podium to give some introductory remarks. Dr. Wojtek. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to do this, and I'm delighted that this is third or fourth time I've been able to be up on this podium, and I hope we continue it uh, long into uh, the rest of the decade, at least. Um, the Kluge Center uh, arrange, uh, agreement that we have with NASA has been extremely important to explore an area that's fundamental to NASA's mission, which is looking at the societal uh, implications of the work that we do at NASA. The search for life has been part of our original mission, and a responsibility to the public has always been a part of our mission, both to inform and educate, to let you know what we're doing, and also to establish studies um, to look at the consequences and benefits of the exploration that we're doing in space. And 
one of the things that we have typically, or we generally focus is on are enabling science. So I run a research program that actually funds research projects to understand the origins and evolution of life here on Earth in order to characterize the sort of habitats we might look for life elsewhere in the uh, solar system and beyond. But one of the areas that we have not made a substantial impact on is really evaluating those societal impacts. And the Kluge Center has, and this chair has served a very important role in allowing uh, us to bring in scholars from the humanities, uh, philosophy, theolo theology, history, um, many uh, other scholars besides scientists to interact with scientists to actually explore these, these very important uh, issues. So I should have probably begun by saying, what can, what can you imagine being more exciting than our discovery of life somewhere else uh, in our universe? And I think that this last half decade or so has been remarkable in encouraging us and informing us on what that search should look like in looking for it and the possibility of finding it. I just highlight that you know it was two years ago that we discovered the first exoplanet. We suspected that there were planets that were orbiting other stars, but we actually confirmed it. And then since then, we've actually discovered thousands of, of um, planets orbiting stars, and at least a couple dozen that might, are in what the so-called habitable zone. That's the distance from a star that allows a planet to actually have a hospitable uh, environment on its surface um, that could potentially support life as we know it. Uh, and now when you look up into the sky, you're not looking at stars, but you're looking at suns. And around each and every one of those suns, we, imag er, we imagine there are planets. So the billions and billions and billions of stars are now, you know, billions and bazillions of, of planets. Uh, and that, that has to be incredibly exciting um, that you yourself can observe. We've spent the last several decades exploring the habitability on Mars and we're learning more and more. You know, our mantra has always been look for the water and we're finding water everywhere. And our most recent launch last week, we launched OSIRIS-REx, which is a mission that's going out to take a sample from an asteroid. And one of the things that we believe about the, those bodies in our solar system is they are responsible for delivering water and organics, two essential things for life, to our planets and delivering it to other places around our solar system that might create habitable environments. In addition, we've started uh, looking at extending what we used to think of as the habitable zone, where you know Earth is in the in the sweet spot, but looking at places like the moons that orbit Saturn, the giant planets, gas planets, Saturn and Jupiter, and looking at the so-called ocean worlds. And we're pleased to see that this has caught the imagination of our lawmaker, policymakers, and lawmakers. And now we have funding. In fact, we just got. A, we usually get unfunded mandates. So somebody decides we need to do something and we don't typically get money. And this year, past year, we got a funded non-mandate. It basically said, we think Ocean Worlds is really important for exploration at NASA and we want you to go set something up. And it wasn't, you know, we didn't have a lot of strings attached and it allowed us to really explore what might be needed to really move forward. And, and the moons that I'm talking about are Enceladus and Europa. And so I'm sure you've heard a lot about this. Enceladus in particular is, is a moon of Saturn that has been spewing its interior ocean which we believe Europa has as well, out into, the, into space. And so we want to have the opportunity to explore these new um, planets or new planetary bodies that could support life. I will also just say my last comment, as you may know that very recently, I think it was within the last two weeks, maybe even last week, losing track of time, it's the end of the fiscal year, kind of crazy at a government agency. Uh, but we, there was a report that scientists had found evidence of life here on Earth at 3.7 billion years ago. That means that it took much less time than we may have thought before for life to start from nothing, just the building blocks, and to have it have arisen to the point where there's enough of it around that we were able to detect it somewhere. And that's a phenomenal uh, discovery. So now we have all these planets orbiting stars. We have planets that seem to be in the right space that could, could support life. And now we know that it's maybe not as hard as we thought for life to occur. So we at NASA and an astrobiology program think it's highly likely that we're going to find somewhere 
somewhere, uh, life somewhere else. And, and when we do, we need to know what all of the public thinks about it, and this seminar is going to address some of those things. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nathaniel. This is a, a great lineup, and thank you all for coming. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Mary, for those remarks. And I just want to say that if uh, we do find life elsewhere, it's going to be a very long time before it evolves into something as cool as the Kluge Center. Uh, I have had an absolutely marvelous time this year. Uh, I've gotten to do all sorts of, I had all sorts of great adventures, uh, not least including getting to go bowling with astrobiologists at the White House, which was really awesome. Mary, I think, got a strike. I got a couple strikes. It was really cool. Uh, and I've been poking around the, the uh, thermal pools at Yellowstone. I've gotten out to the, joint, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and made uh, chemical gardens. It's the, the access, the, the library is an obvious and incredible set of resources, but NASA also provides an amazing set of resources that, uh, that we can draw upon. And getting to have both of those and try to pull that together into something meaningful has been a, a tremendous treat. So I just wanted to give you a very brief uh, sort of conceptual overview of the conference. I'm not, I'm not going to take long uh, before we can um, turn it over and begin the actual sessions. But I wanted to tell you a little bit. Well, first of all, let me just thank everybody here at the Kluge Center uh, for their, this is an amazing team of incredibly professional and friendly and warm people. Uh, Jason Steinhauer, Dan Torello, uh, and especially Joanne Kitching, the administrator here who keeps everything together. Uh, and John back here does an incredible job with the AV. So thank you to everybody. Uh, oh, and not, to, not to forget Emily, uh, also a very, very important member of the team. So thank you. Okay. Um, I so my project, as uh, Mary said, has been to examine the history, the recent history of origins of life research. In the last. 35 or 40 years, the way scientists have thought about the origin of life has changed dramatically. It is, I know, I, historians shy away from the word scientific revolution. It's, you know, become kind of a cliche, but it's a scientific revolution. The, the, the old, what you learned about the, the primordial soup and all that stuff is gone. The soup is out the window. And there are whole new ways of thinking about how life emerges. And it's a tremendously exciting period. And so I've been trying to piece some of that together. And um, so that's been my project. And what I wanted to do today was to bring together groups of people who are working on different aspects of that problem. And one of my favorite things to do is to get people who rarely talk to each other in a serious way together talking in a serious way. So I have invited historians, philosophers, scientists, and science writers to bring, to bring their expertise to bear on questions of the search for life, the origins of life uh, on Earth. And in the lab, which means synthetic biology, uh, efforts to create life in the lab has a lot of overlap with uh, the search for the or study of the, um, the possible mechanisms of the origins of life on Earth. Uh, some people, such as Steve Benner, have actually worked in both of those areas. Uh, and then, of course, all of that bears upon the search for the possibility of life as we know it on other planets. So these are all very much integrated dimensions of, uh, of astrobiology. And I am absolutely thrilled to have such a great group of, uh, of experts here. These are some of the, uh, the, the absolute top people in, in their areas. And um, you all should feel very privileged to get a chance to, uh, to meet all these folks. And I encourage you at coffee break to try to engage them. They're also all very nice, warm people. So um, 
With that, I think we're going to turn it over to Nkisan Akpan, who is uh, the, um, with the uh, PBS NewsHour, the senior science producer, is that? Uh, with, with them, and uh, he is going to be moderating the, the first session. What I've done is asked uh, some of the, the best science writers I know to, to moderate these sessions. What they're great at is interpreting science and scholarship uh, in ways that, that regular people can understand, and really good at interviewing people and pulling out the important themes. So I've asked them to, to do that, and they're going to be leading some discussion with the panelists and fielding questions with the, uh, with the audience. Okay? So with that, Nkisan? Hmm? You ready to? I'm set, yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I just want to start by thanking the Library of Congress, NASA, and the Kluge Center for inviting me to moderate what I think is going to be a very fascinating panel. The title of that panel is The Emergence of Life on Earth, and we have one programming note in that uh, Jim Cleaves uh, couldn't make it today due to a personal matter. So our first speaker is actually going to our, be our last speaker, uh, Nathaniel. Uh, Nathaniel, as you heard, is the Bloomberg NASA Library of Congress Chair in Astrobiology here at the Kluge Center. He's also a professor of history and medicine at the Johns Hopkins University, at Johns Hopkins University. And uh, his current research focuses on the origin of life. And his talk today is going to focus on the creation of the early genetic code. Uh, our other speaker is Matt Schrenk. Uh, he's an assistant professor in the departments of Earth and Environmental Science, Sciences and Microbiology and Molecular Genetics at Mi Michigan State University. Uh, his research studies micro microbial activities in hydrothermal environments in the deep sea and deep earth. And uh, his recent publications have focused on genomics-based methods to study the function and evolution of these uh, microbes in order to sort of glean a picture of what early microbes might have looked like. So with no further ado, Nathaniel. All right, first um, let me just say that this is uh, uh, very much a work in progress uh, because this is stuff that I've been doing uh, all this, this past year. So uh, some of the data for this talk has actually come in this week. So please bear with me. Uh, a lot of this is new. I've been really trying to integrate uh, a lot of new material. Um, but if you can bear with me, and it gets a little geeky at times, I admit. But if you bear with me, uh, I'm going to give you all you need to know. You don't have to be a, a technical scientist uh, to understand this. And if you do, you'll have a better appreciation, I think, of how science works and why we think about the origins of life the way we do. I open with one of my favorite uh, illustrations by M.C. Escher, Three Worlds. In one sense, this is all one world, of course, right? Yet the tree and the carp are unaware of each other. The pond's surface, the interface between the two, reflects one and, re and reveals the other. In the world of the picture, it constructs both. Well, I want to do something similar to that with one of the central concepts in origin of life research, the RNA world. The usual explanation of what the RNA world is goes something like this. There's a chicken and egg problem at the heart of modern biology. Most of the genes spelled out in our DNA uh, encode the instructions for making proteins. Among the most important proteins are enzymes, complex molecules that catalyze biological reactions. Among the reactions that enzymes catalyze are the synthesis of DNA. In other words, you can't make proteins without genes, and you can't make genes without proteins. How did the system evolve? The RNA world breaks this infinite loop. Differing from DNA by only one atom, it's capable of storing information, just like DNA. But it's usually single-stranded, which means it's more chemically reactive than DNA. 
In fact, in, in the 1980s, researchers found that RNA can act as an enzyme. It can then, in theory, copy itself. Uh, perhaps it also evolved a way to make proteins. So, poof, there goes the chicken and egg problem, and a bird-like dinosaur gave rise to both, right? That's the RNA world. So the RNA world then describes a time very early in evolution, before DNA, before protein, when RNA did both jobs. Eventually, it handed off information storage to DNA, which is more stable and can copy itself very easily. And it handed off most catalysis to proteins, which are more complex and versatile and, and therefore more powerful. The canonical history of the RNA world is very simple. In the 1960s, they say, researchers first speculated on the idea of RNA catalysis. Uh, the first person always mentioned is Francis Crick of Watson and Crick and the double helix. And uh, often, usually mentioned, is his colleague Leslie Orgel. Sometimes, the renegade microbiologist Carl Woos is also mentioned. Then people say there was a period in which not much was done with this idea because it was just a speculation and no one knew what to do with it until in the early 80s, RNA catalysis was actually found by uh, it, twice by Tom Check's group at Colorado and then uh, independently by Sidney Altman's group at Yale. And then shortly thereafter, the RNA world was articulated by Walter Gilbert in 1986. And that's sort of it. Well, uh, surprise, surprise, uh, I've found that there's a lot more to it than that. There's a rich context and an earlier history going back to the early 1950s that I can only wave at today. I'm going to spend most of my time cutting into this period of, uh, in which so supposedly nothing happened. And I'm going to close with a few remarks on how the, this uh, narrative of the RNA world that people understand was carved out of this, uh, uh, all of this other stuff that I'm going to be talking about. My hope is to give you at least a taste of what was really at stake in the creation of the RNA world. So here briefly are the remarks that earned the early guys credit for, practice, for uh, predicting the RNA world. In his 1967 book, The Genetic Code, Carl Woese wrote of the era of nucleic acid life. This was based on a speculative and later disproven idea uh, about the function of the molecule transfer RNA. Uh, and in this, Woese concluded that a proto-RNA could have been the original genome. Then the next year, Francis Crick imagined that the primitive uh, protein synthesis machinery could have been made entirely of RNA. In a companion paper in the same journal, his colleague Leslie Orgel said that a primordial protein-only world was impossible because uh, of the nature of, of proteins. They're not able to template their own repro uh, replication. And a uh, nucleic acid-only world was possible, but he said it wouldn't have gotten very far. Uh, it, it, um, it, it wouldn't have gotten past what he called the stage of evolutionary doodling until it had in, e evolved a genetic code to link nucleic acids and proteins. Okay? So those are, so my main point here is, is simply that the, uh, because the early RNA world evolved a, around the genetic code and its origin, it presumed the existence of protein. That's not true for the later RNA world. So uh, thinking about the genetic code implies an RNA protein world. Because today is, oh, and here's the RNA, protein world. This is the genetic code. And um, 
So even from these brief snippets, it's obvious that all of these three were writing in the context of making proteins, right? The genetic code and the nucleotide sequence of uh, the transfer RNA had just been solved uh, in the preceding years, in the 1960s. Crowning touches on a decade's worth of spectacular research characterizing the machinery uh, involved in reading out the nucleic acid sequence and converting it into proteins. Okay? And the whole complicated process was shot through with RNA. We had messenger RNA, transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA. Uh, and so molecular biologists saw the flow of genetic information through the cell as one of the defining essences of life. And this essence was mediated by RNA. Even though they weren't trained in evolutionary biology, they immediately recognized the question of how something as abstract and self-referential as the genetic code could have evolved, and, and, and that that was a knotty and important problem. Okay? So this is the RNA protein world. Now, because my focus today is mainly on Walter Gilbert, I'm going to jump uh, forward a few years to 1976. That year, Gilbert and his student, Alan Maxim, invented a new technique for sequencing DNA. There, the, the paper describing the method was published in February of 1977. This uh, followed the method invented by Frederick Sanger in 1975, but Maxim Gilbert sequencing was a good deal faster. And it became the method of choice for sequencing DNA until automated DNA sequencing came in in the 1990s, which sort of uh, sent, sent us hurtling toward the Human Genome Project. Gilbert had trained as a physicist, but had been immersed in the RNA world since the mid-1950s. Uh, he had participated in the discovery of messenger RNA in 1960, and he shared the laboratory of Jim Watson, the other half of Watson and Crick. Uh, at Harvard. And in uh, 1976, Watson moved down to Long Island to become uh, full-time director of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and bequeathed his entire lab to Gilbert. And Gilbert did some pretty interesting things there. So in the spring of 1977, the immunologist Susumu Tonogawa visited Gilbert's lab and uh, in order to sequence the, uh, s some of the genes that he was finding in, uh, for immunoglobulins, important uh, molecules in, uh, that create the antigens that recognize the antibodies in our immune system. Okay? And Gilbert says, when, when, he's, when, when he says Tonegawa came to sequence it, he meant that Maxim sequenced it. Uh, and Maxim found, when he was doing this, found this 93 base sequence that appeared to be skipped over during transcription. So the messenger RNA from the gene was missing this, this chunk of DNA, right? Uh, and they didn't quite know what to do with that. Uh, but that June, they went down to Long Island to the, to the annual symposium at Cold Spring Harbor Lab, where they heard about a stunning new development in gene structure in higher organisms, or eukaryotes. Independently, Richard Roberts, a scientist at Cold Spring Harbor, and Phil Sharp, who'd been at Cold Spring Harbor, but was now, by this time, at MIT, uh, performed essentially the same experiment. They captured the messenger RNA <coughs> from a viral gene and then uh, um, hybridized it to the original DNA gene. And when they did so and, the, and looked at it under the electron microscope, they found these loops, okay? So the uh, messenger RNA, you can see, is, is binding to the, um, the DNA and it's skipping over chunks of the DNA. In other words, the DNA gene existed in segments with little spacers in between them, okay? Uh, this was one of the many discoveries in science that made anomalies in other researchers' data suddenly make sense. Rich Roberts told me in, back in 1993, they all had the data in their notebooks. All they had to do was go back and reinterpret it. Gilbert went back and reinterpreted it. So, after the symposium, he took a trip to Europe 
Gilbert likes to travel the world. And he went to Switzerland to visit Tonegawa. He went to Poland to visit another scientist. And as he was traveling around, he said, he had a big idea. The genes weren't in pieces, he, he thought. They weren't just in pieces, he thought. They must be modular. He imagined that the coding regions represented ancient mini-genes that would have functioned on their own. And he was already by this time calling the intervening sequences introns and the coding regions exons, okay? And the evolutionary role of introns, he thought, was to enable the exons to be shuffled in order to rapidly create complex genes. When I came back to Harvard for the fall term, Gilbert told me, I was very excited about the exon shuffling idea and gave it as a seminar, centering on the idea that genes in pieces might explain the Cambrian evolution, uh, Cam Cambrian explosion. The evolutionary burst around 540 million years ago in which most of the major animal phyla appeared. Introns had not been seen in bacteria. They had only been seen in eukaryotes, higher organisms. So if, as many people believed, simple prokaryotes like bacteria had evolved into complex eukaryotes, then, Gilbert thought, the introduction of introns could have sped the diversification of higher organisms, leading to the Cambrian explosion. Now, note that this reasoning is based on a lot of assumptions that are no longer believed as to be true. Okay? But this is the way he was thinking, and it was reasonable thinking at the time. So Ford Doolittle began a sabbatical year in Gilbert's lab that same fall when Gilbert came back all excited. Uh, and he remembers Gilbert's seminar and he told me that afterward he went home that night and, in, and wrote an essay in response. Doolittle had trained under Carl Woese, who was at this time campaigning heavily to get rid of this idea of a prokaryote to eukaryote progression in evolution. And Doolittle was kind of infected with that idea. Why should we think that prokaryotes were primitive and disadvantaged, he reasoned. Perhaps introns had always been present all the way back to the last common ancestor and had subsequently been streamlined out of the prokaryotic lineage for enabling them to adapt in a different way to their environment. So this became known as the introns early theory. Okay? Well, Gilbert liked this idea. He, it pushed exon shuffling back earlier in evolution than he'd thought. So he had to relinquish the Cambrian explosion. Uh, so, so much, but, but shuffling there in return, he gained evolutionary primacy. This was a fundamental thing in evolution. So, uh, so that seemed a good trade-off. And he, he wrote up this idea as a now classic essay, Why Genes in Pieces. This appeared in February of 1978, and for Doolittle's response appeared two months later in April. In a conference paper titled Playgrounds of Evolution, published the next year, Gilbert argued that if exons were mini-genes, then they ought to correspond to functional protein domains, right? They ought to have made functional things at one point, and if they were mixed and matched to put together more complex things, you ought to see them correspond when you look at more complicated proteins, such as this immunoglobulin mo molecule, okay? Uh, and so the pool of exons in the genome at any given time would prov provide a set of Lego-like parts from which evolution could draw to make complex proteins. He concluded poetically that exons were inserted into a background of non-coding DNA. Like bubbles, he wrote, the exons float on a sea of introns. In 1980, Gilbert received the Nobel Prize for DNA sequencing. In his Nobel lecture, he talked about DNA sequencing, but he also spent a lot of time discussing evolution and exon shuffling. So clearly these ideas were all linked in his mind. Well, Doolittle began to diverge from Gilbert. 
Evolution, he said, can't think ahead and invent things in order to speed future evolution. Right? In 1980, jumping off from Richard Dawkins' uh, argument, that an, argument uh, that an organism is a gene's way of making more genes, Doolittle said, in essence, wait a second, not all DNA is genes. Any DNA that replicates itself ought to spread whether or not it encodes a protein. This suggests that a lot of DNA should merely be junk. And this is the origin of the, uh, the notion of junk DNA, which you've probably heard. Francis Crick and Leslie Orgel had roughly the same idea at the same time. Selfish DNA, they said, could be considered parasitic because it takes metabolic energy to make and to maintain it. So it, has, it should have some cost to the organism. And they published the ideas back to back in the journal Nature. It was on this background, did I, did I go forward? Okay, it was on this background then that catalytic RNA was discovered. In 1982, working in the, uh, with the eukaryotic pond animal Tetrahymena, uh, pictured here on the left, Tom Check at Colorado found an intron in a ribosomal RNA gene that spliced itself out of the messenger RNA. Okay? It didn't require another enzyme to come in and cut it out. It could just pop out. The next year, Sid Altman at Yale published a paper on RNase P, which is a, an enzyme that has a protein part and an RNA part. And what it does is snip off part of the transfer RNA and activate it. And in, accidentally, in a control experiment, he found that, one of his technicians actually, found that the RNA component alone could catalyze that reaction. Okay? Uh, and so this was a big surprise. So we have two examples back to back of catalytic RNA. Now we know that this can actually happen. So these papers caused a sensation accompanied by uh, much speculation. And uh, so in 1985, Norm Pace, another member of the Carl Woese lineage, suggested that Czech's self splicing introns could be parasitic selfish transposons, a la Crick and Doolittle. He also proposed an RNA world. He suggested that originally RNA could have served as both genotype and phenotype. In other words, as both gene and enzyme. So this is an important idea because it links this intron idea with, uh, and selfish DNA to the idea of RNA as the original molecule. But Gilbert stuck to his guns. The same year, he revisited his exon theory of genes, comparing it against the data that had been gathered since 1978. In some cases, the predictions bore, bore him out. In other cases, not. Ever the optimist, he concluded that the glass was half full. The exon theory of genes, he said, had held up rather well. This, then, is the context for Gilbert's classic paper, which we can call the RNA only world. He opened the paper with the recent discoveries of RNA splicing, but they were several years old by this time. Why an editorial at this moment? Because the paper was as much about introns as it was about RNA splicing. Most people quote the deservedly famous line from the paper, one can contemplate an RNA world. Uh, containing only RNA molecules that serve to catalyze the synthesis of themselves. And th this then is the classical RNA world described with Gilbert's characteristic literary flair. But the paper also stated, this picture of the RNA world is one of replicating molecules that reassort exons by transposable elements created by introns. Okay? So in a recent email, Gilbert confirmed, my stress in the RNA world paper, he said, was twofold. One was being struck with the idea of RNA splicing, uh, with the idea of RNA enzymes doing everything, he said. And the second was the RNA-based exon shuffling of RNA pieces as a way of speeding up evolution. But the second idea would be written out of the received narrative. 
Gilbert's paper led to a Cold Spring Harbor symposium the next year uh, in which one of our participants, Stephen Benner, participated. He may be hiding behind that tree or maybe that's his shoulder, I'm not sure. Um, but a published volume followed in 1993 with later editions in 1999, 2005, 2010. The RNA world became a plurality of worlds, as new research revealed many new roles uh, for RNA molecules in the cell. Today, RNA world denotes a world of contemporary physiology as, w as much as one of chemical evolution. RNA world became a meme. Here's an image taken from Carl Zimmer's Science Tattoo Emporium, in which a guy got a tattoo of the RNA world, except that he uh, changed the RNA to DNA because he thought it looked better. So the double helix looked cool. So here's an RNA world with no RNA. Okay. And the received version of the history of the RNA world began to crystallize within the scientific community, roughly the one with which I began, the chicken and egg thing. Okay. This quote from Crick and Orgel in 1993 represents an act of myth-making. You can see all the elements of that first RNA world that I described to you at the beginning here. The RNA world, he said, they called uh, retrospectively the most important novel concept relevant to uh, our papers of 1968. Um, it was just, we were thinking about it, you know, it's just we didn't have the name yet. Uh, that he goes straight to Check and Altman. He talks about specific catalysts made of RNA, not about exon shuffling. And uh, the, the key idea idea of being a biochemistry based on RNA alone. Okay? All right. I'm not calling them out as, you know, doing something really unusual. This kind of thing shouldn't be surprising. Internal histories almost always work this way. Okay? Workers in the field make tacit decisions about what counts as being worth passing down to students. Who, what and who does and does not deserve credit, and so forth. So my point here, though, is that myth-making has consequences. There's a politics and a culture to which stories are called true. So I've shown you several RNA worlds. The RNA protein world, the selfish RNA world, the RNA-only world, and a constructed RNA world. All of them are real, and all of them are imagined. It's incontrovertible that RNA lies at the heart of many fundamental and ancient biological processes. And it's nearly certain that RNA preceded DNA in evolution. But beyond that, these are models, right? They can guide experiments, but they can never be proven. That makes them incredibly interesting as a historical topic. The plurality of worlds may be, in fact, not a flaw, but a virtue. The power of the RNA world may lie precisely in its ambiguity, in its existence as a kind of virtual reality in which we all see what we want to see. Thank you. Are we going to just go on to the next, or do you want to take a few questions now? Or? Okay. And yeah, we'll okay. The next. okay, sure. So, if there are any questions, I'll be glad to. Yes, hi. Just curious. Just curious. Couldn't more than one of those worlds exist at the same time? Uh, Let's see, in what sense? I mean, there's, there either was protein, either RNA and protein evolved simultaneously, or they didn't, right? So which, which ones would you think could, well, could be you, simultaneous? Well, yeah, it's a big world, and <laughs> things could happen in different places in, oh, different, and it, different, uh, in different orders, mm. making the world much more complex than yes. we, we would like. Absolutely right. And so that's why I was thinking, wait a minute, why, why is it only one? Right, right, right. I, I didn't mean to imply that there 
need be only one. Um, these are different models. I, what, what I found in the field is that people glom on to one and they defend it, you know, vigorously. Uh, yeah, fiercely in, in many cases. Uh, but of course, there's no reason to suspect that you know, at some point in one privileged part of the ocean, a single cell drifted up to the surface and began photosynthesizing. You know, uh, it, it could have, there many people uh, 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 line up with Matt Schrank and, and think that, uh, that uh, deep sea hydrothermal vents are a very logical place for life to have begun, but those existed in lots of different conditions. And there are still people arguing that no, life probably e emerged in, in, uh, on land with, in, in ponds that evaporated and had repeated cycles of drying and wetting. Um, the, the vent people say, yeah, but land wasn't there wasn't any land yet, but that's a whole separate debate. Um, so yeah, you're right. The, uh, the, in, in that sense, it's theoretically possible that you could have an RNA-only world in one system and somewhere around the globe, maybe protein evolves at the same time. Yeah. Yes, David, and then. debating whether to ask it, but it, it strikes me that it's, it's closely related in an interesting way possibly to, to the previous question. I was wondering about how deterministic this might be in terms of being an astrobiologist, thinking about other planets and the process you're describing. Might we expect something analogous or even identical on other worlds? Um, if it's not so deterministic and it could happen different ways, then it strikes me that the previous question um, is relevant that it could happen in different ways in different locations yeah. on the earth and possibly the interaction between what's happening in, in similar nearby environments could complicate the picture. There may not be one linear progression in one place that the geography of difference could even uh, become a part of this. That's great. Thank you. That, that's a really good point. And I would say that's an example of why the history matters, right? If we accept the received version of the history, then we think there's only one RNA world. But if we look at the way the scientists were thinking and writing and talking, and who were the different allegiances and groups that were debating and what the, what the real stakes were, then we're kind of freed up intellectually. We can think about different kinds of RNA worlds, and maybe there's one RNA world on one world and another RNA world on another world, right? Uh, so that's what I mean by uh, the received history having, having stakes and, and why it matters to, to uncover them. So thank you. Yeah. Yes? I don't see Karzima here, so in his defense... Oh, he's here. <laughs> Uh, okay. There Sorry. Okay. There. Persistence of RNA world implies replication. So it means that there should have been double-stranded RNA. So that tattoo was not wrong. <laughs> so you're, you're absolutely right, and I knew somebody was going to ask that question. Uh, I, I think Carl will back me up and say that the, the caption from the guy with the tattoo, said that he substituted DNA for RNA because it looked better. But you're absolutely right. RNA can be double-stranded. So I think the guy missed an opportunity. He made himself unnecessarily look a little bit like a doofus. He could have just said, oh, yeah, it's double-stranded RNA. Yeah. So. Mary. Oh, Carl, did you want to chime in on that? Or a separate, separate question? OK. Mary? So I have two things. One is um, I think most of the astrobiology community is leaning towards the idea that life probably arose many times, and which is consistent with lots of different RNA worlds potentially, and that what we are observing here on Earth at this moment is the winner. Right. And, and so, you yeah. know, rewinding, I'm sure you'd see a lot of possibilities. The other thing I would say that, um, that is a challenge, I think, for the metabolism first people, and Matt, maybe I should have asked you, I'll ask you again, wherever you are. Matt is right over here. Oh, yeah. there you are. <laughs> you, you um, is that I don't know that we actually know when uh, plate tectonics 
was initiated and was pervasive on the planet. Yeah. And hydrothermal vents are largely driven by those sorts of activities. So they may have been late yeah. to the game as well. And so, um, and maybe after we had continents. I mean, it, it, you know, a lot of this, the geologic history of Earth um, becomes sort of complicating in the whole picture of how, what, what, what the origins were. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, one of the many mind-blowing things that has happened to me this year was uh, a few weeks ago uh, when you uh, hooked me up with Penny Boston, the new head of uh, the, Nas the uh, National Astrobiology Institute. Um, and she is a geologist who goes down in caves. And she told me, she spun this whole model of the amazing bacterial and archaeal life down in, way down deep in the, in the crust, all, even possibly into the mantle of the earth, and said that a lot of that could have predated plate tectonics. And some of those uh, organisms might have been shifting around with the tectonic plates. And that means that life possibly could have even predated the late heavy bombardment. I mean, so we could be pushed back even before that 3.7 billion years, right? So she has this remarkable vision of not, you know, we're used to thinking of the world as a big rock clothed with life. And her concept is a, a, an integrated mineral, a biogeological system that rock and life are inherently integrated. And think about that if a little drop of sweat occurs on your, on your brow in here. What's in it? Salt, minerals, right? So we're constantly, life is flowing through rock and rock is flowing through life constantly, right? So, uh, yeah, so the next, so I told her, yeah, so we finished the conversation by my saying, can I come down in a cave? And she said, sure, so, you know, I can't wait. <laughs> Any more? Uh, Carl had one. Move on. I'm just worried, I'm just uh, curious, uh, sort of historically, like as you've been looking at the RNA world as it was being explored, described, and so on in its different forms, um, how much were people thinking of it as an investigation of the origin of life versus uh, a transition, you know, with some, something before it, then you go to RNA life, and then you get then you get to RNA, DNA, protein, life. I'm sort of wondering, because you showed the feathered dinosaur, you know, and that's a great transitional form, and that's a quite, there you're just sort of wondering, like, okay, how did birds get in the air with feathers? Right. And then you look at the, those dinosaurs. Right. So, so the RNA world in that case might be in this transitional form, and maybe you got something else before it, maybe some, some, some molecules like PNA or something that aren't even around anymore. Right. I'm just curious, like, when the people were, historically developing the idea of the RNA world, uh, how, the, how were they framing it? Were they saying, like, we go from nothing to RNA, or were they saying something and then RNA, and that addresses this basic transition question? Right, okay. Uh, <laughs> the zone of magic. Yeah, the, the, one of the things that, that interests me about the RNA world is that it's at, it is precisely at that transitional place, and you have, you know, one group of scientists who tend to work downward, uh, working down the phylogenetic tree back to the last universal common ancestor and trying to drive back down to the RNA world. You have another group who are coming up from the geology and, the, and you know, basically trying to make life out of rocks and seawater. And the RNA world sits right in the middle there. And some people think that that would be life and some people, some people think that that's a pre, you know, proto-life Originally, the first people like Crick and Orgel and Gilbert had a pretty, as I said, they're basically practicing evolution without a license. And so they had a pretty simplistic kind of primordial soup notion that there would just be this pool of nucleotides floating around that would gather together into strands of RNA that would replicate. And then 
there would be some amino acids floating around in the pool and they would somehow glom onto them, right? So they didn't really think about that. And one of the uh, really exciting things to me this year was to get to talk to and read a whole bunch about the people who are working from bottom up, right? And it's too bad that Jim Cleaves isn't here because uh, he thinks of himself as, as going sideways, uh, coming at it from a different angle. But um, that's one of the that's one of the things that has come out of this, the last few decades of origin of life research, that this, this really is an area where, you know, it, and when, this is why the ambiguity, I think, is valuable, because you can toss around a, world, a, a term like RNA world, and everybody kind of knows what you mean, and you say, so we're trying to get, you know, ideally we'd like to get from, uh, you know, dinucleotides and, and, and the, the, the reverse uh, you know, TCA cycle up to the RNA world, whatever that is. And other people would say, you know, well, this could lead down to eventually the RNA world, and, they can, and those people can talk to each other because they sort of, because there's enough slippage in the term that it enables people with different languages to speak to each other. Yeah? Okay, I think with that I will leave it. We'll have more time for a general discussion afterward, but I don't want to take any time away from, from Matt. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, um, well, first off, it's, it's a real honor and a privilege to be speaking to you all. Thank you, Nathaniel, for inviting me into the Kluge Center for um, hosting this event. I'm really excited not only to tell you about the research that my uh, lab group conducts and, and the places we've been, but also to hear from the range of different studies that are being conducted uh, by people in this room and, and the, the vast amount of knowledge related to this topic that they bring to the table. Um, so my group at Michigan State uh, studies uh, modern microorganisms in extreme environments. Um, many of these are geothermal systems, hot environments uh, at the bottom of the ocean and associated with volcanoes. Uh, some of the sponsors of our work uh, include uh, NASA Astrobiology Institute, uh, as well as the Deep Carbon Observatory and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Um, and so we, we look at this interface between geological and biological processes in modern systems. Let's see. All right. Hmm. Oh. So um, I'm going to provide a little bit of context related to the early Earth environment and uh, origins of life um, theories uh, because I wasn't sure exactly what some of the other speakers were covering today. Uh, but really, I want to get into some of the insights we have from looking at these modern systems, uh, describing to you what these systems are all about, first and foremost, and then subsequently, uh, what are some of the characteristics of the geomicrobiology in these systems, and how they might stimulate future directions to consider in origins of life research, um, both from the bottom up and top down sorts of approaches, or perhaps even sideways approaches, if you can imagine that. Uh, so, as Nathaniel said earlier, the warm little pond is out the window, but just to, uh, just to point out, um, you know, and put this into context, it's the, the ideas uh, dating uh, back to Darwin and, and even further back, Pasteur and others, thinking about uh, organosynthesis reactions, uh, these warm little ponds stimulated by uh, heat or electricity or light, uh, originating some of the first biomolecules and subsequently the first organisms, um, thereby serving as inspiration uh, for experiments like the Miller-Urey synthesis experiment in 1953, where they took uh, water in a highly reducing atmosphere with things like methane and hydrogen and ammonia, and uh, create, used a spark discharge to generate some of the first uh, abiologically produced amino acids at that point. Uh, now, it turns out that that system was a whole lot more complicated um, than the initial experiment suggested, uh, that perhaps the early atmosphere was not uh, as reduced, for example, as they used in their experiment. But it really um, stimulated a long line of experimental research um, into the possibilities for organosynthesis reactions. And whether you think the conditions were right or not, um, it's become apparent over the years through uh, explorations of the solar system 
and the organic matter uh, contained within these uh, objects within our solar system that organosynthesis reactions occur are widespread um, in space. Uh, for example, in the atmosphere of, uh, of some of these icy moons, uh, such as Titan, you have UV stimulated radiation uh, of, of simple molecules, of small molecules, uh, synthesis reactions, uh, uh, continuing on and thereby creating more and more complex organic molecules. Uh, also, through the exploration of meteorites, and, uh, and comets and, and the, the very high levels of these uh, materials that were hitting the Earth during the uh, Hadean uh, period. Uh, all of these, uh, in particular, the carbonaceous chondrites are very organic rich. So they contain a range of organic compounds. Um, you know, macromolecular carbon can comprise 70 to 80% of the total carbon, uh, for example, uh, in these materials. And they contain a range of compounds, including amino acids, aromatics, purines, and pyrimidines. So some of these uh, building blocks of these larger organic molecules uh, that we've been talking about. So, and then, and then uh, my favorite topic, the hydrothermal vents. Um, so these are areas associated with, uh, primarily with uh, magmatic uh, upwelling in the earth. Uh, they serve to drive uh, the input of seawater and hydrothermal circulation up to 65 million years away from the ridge axis. Uh, they were first discovered in the late 1970s and they've really revolutionized many areas of science including microbiology and our understanding of uh, evolutionary biology and, and biodiversity on this planet. Um, uh, some of the most apparent life forms there are things like the giant tube worms uh, shown on the right hand side here but there's uh, underlying this, there's a rich diversity of microbial life in these systems as well. Uh, so these systems have uh, very st steep gradients in both temperature and chemistry associated with them as the cool oxidized seawater, at least in the modern day Earth, percolates through the subsurface, is heated up, reacts with subsurface rocks, and then is vented onto the sea floor. Uh, containing uh, high temperature fluids up to 407 degrees Celsius. Uh, rich in dissolved metals, and uh, and also shows the potential for abiogenic synthesis. Okay, so you know there were numerous sources of heat on the Hydean Earth: heat from accretion, radiolytic decay, and energy from meteoritic impacts that potentially drive hydrothermal cir circulation. These systems are rich in ca catalytic mineral surfaces. Um, these systems are generally made of metal sulfide materials. And uh, perhaps with all of this bombardment and this very harsh surface environment, perhaps subsurface environments associated with these systems protected uh, proto-life and, and even some of the uh, early molecular reactions from uh, the damaging effects of all these impacts. Um, and nowadays there's, there's evidence for prolific abiogenic organosynthesis reactions, abiogenically produced organic molecules, particularly at ultramafic hosted hydrothermal vents. These are rocks that are, that are uh, more reducing, um, commonly characteristic of deeper portions of the earth, such as the mantle, that, that stimulate the production of uh, high concentrations of hydrogen as well as abiogenic small organic molecules. Um, so my point was not to uh, focus on any one of these, not even on deep sea hydrothermal vents uh, in particular. The, the point is that there are many different sources of organic molecules likely to have occurred on the early earth and all of these play, likely played some role uh, in, in this uh, system. Uh, additionally, you know, as Nathaniel talked about quite a bit in his talk as well, or at least the RNA world uh, component of this, there are several problems we need to solve when it comes to going from these ab abiotic organosynthesis reactions to the first cells, or the first things we could recognize as, as uh, living organisms. Uh, the extent to which we need membranes to encapsulate and protect some of these early biomolecules and reactions, and the order in which that occurred uh, in the whole chicken and egg uh, scenario. Um, the, our ability to catalyze larger and more complex molecules under appropriate chemistries uh, is a continual work in progress uh, in terms of uh, making things that uh, are, are more functional and productive in terms of um, 
the relationship to, to the first cells. And then thinking about how these properties, how these success stories are then inherited um, and these emergent properties uh, propagate through the system and are stored uh, in, in information storage, whether that is in minerals, DNA, RNA, or other molecules. So we're still a long ways um, uh, from the first functioning protocells. We, we, have, we still have a, a lot of work to do to connect the dots from the, from the bottom up and the, and the top down. Um, but what I do think is important is I think, and I forget which one of the uh, people in the audience asked this, I think it was David, about the complexity of these natural systems. It's likely that there was not just one location for these reactions to be occurring. It's likely that they were all occurring um, simultaneously or perhaps there was you know, uh, some sort of temporal aspect as well, but there's complexity to the environment. It's not just a, a warm little pond or a beaker full of chemicals. It's you know, a, a moving dynamic system, uh, moving through space and moving through time. Uh, as my PhD advisor has, has put it, uh, John Barrows, for a number of years, uh, the origin of life probably occurred as a one kilometer cell uh, connecting many different uh, environments. Uh, so, so people like Mike Russell have taken this and, and developed and articulated models connecting um, some of the some of these thermal and chemical gradients uh, and how they might drive the synthesis of organic molecules and some of the first cells, uh, some of the first uh, uh, you know, things resembling uh, protocells, uh, using the natural physical and chemical characteristics of environments like hydrothermal vent chimneys as uh, templates or analogs for, for some of these reactions to occur. Um, uh, John Barros's group, uh, with the lead author, um, Eva Stukin, uh, put out this really nice paper a few years ago in geobiology, sort of tying together, not just at the hydrothermal vent scale, but at, at the global scale, um, how Earth could serve as a global chemical reactor, providing different catalysts in different reaction conditions uh, as part of a dynamic system, in, encompassing many of the different uh, inputs we've talked about already, meteorites, atmospheric chemistry, and hydrothermalism. So the world is complex. It's complex now, and it was complex uh, back uh, four billion years ago as well. And I think we need to take this complexity and diversity into account uh, rather than being pigeonholed into a particular type of reaction or region where it can occur. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the ancient Earth was complex, but so is the modern Earth. Uh, this is an example of a heavily serpentinized rock, a water rock reaction. Uh, the microbes, this is a common sort of system that my laboratory studies, um, one type of system where water is flowing through subsurface materials. Um, all of this mosaic and uh, mosaic fra fracture network here uh, are the habitats in which microorganisms in these systems occur. But you know, I'm not an organic chemist, I'm not a uh, paleontologist uh, or, or any of these things. My laboratory studies environmental micro microbiology. We get out in the field, we go to extreme environments, and we collect samples. We try to figure out how the microbes are operating, how they survive these conditions, how they interact with the geochemical and physical environment. And then if there are clues within this, these systems that tell us something uh, in these as analogs to early Earth conditions, um, you know, I, th I think they can be used to inform some of these bottom-up uh, types of approaches. Um, but the other thing that I haven't heard mentioned yet that I think is really valuable about these types of environments is that these are systems on the modern-day Earth where you have this interface of abiotic and biotic processes. As you drill down deeper into the Earth, you cross some divide, or you're likely to cross some divide. We haven't reached it yet in some cases. Uh, between uh, abiotic carbon cycling and the biosphere, right? And, and we need to study these systems carefully and understand uh, how organisms in these systems might use these abiotic compounds and how to define the properties of living and non-living systems. So the point is I think the environments I'm going to describe in just a second here have values um, not just as analogs for early Earth type of conditions but also as uh, as observatories, places to look to better understand the relationship between living and non-living parts of the Earth. 
So one of uh, our favorite types of systems is the deep sea hydrothermal vents. Uh, here's a typical example of that here. Um, you ha this, these are places in the middle of the ocean. There's a 65,000 kilometer long mid ocean ridge spreading center network on the planet uh, right now where uh, seawater percolates through the subsurface, reacts with the rock, and then is vented out through these hydrothermal vent chimneys known as black smokers. Uh, within the subsurface and within the walls of these chimneys, um, which can be uh, you know, tens of meters off of the seafloor, uh, you have really uh, steep gradients in temperature and chemistry between the 300 plus degrees Celsius uh, hydrothermal fluids and the two degrees Celsius seawater. Uh, these, uh, these fluids are also very diverse in terms of their chemistry. The hydrothermal fluid is full of metals, um, which make this uh, the black smoke that's coming out of the chimney, uh, whereas the seawater is largely oxic and has uh, a variety of uh, uh, compounds that can be used uh, potentially to to oxidize or respire some of these uh, components coming out of the hydrothermal fluids. Um, just a few years ago, or now it's been more than a few years ago, back in 2000, uh, a new type of hydrothermal system was discovered called the Lost City Hydrothermal Field. Um, this was discovered uh, near the Mid-Atlantic Ridge um, by a group of researchers at the University of Washington. And the differences here are that uh, instead of having very high temperature hydrothermal fluids coming out that are very acidic and metal rich, here you have fluids influenced by a process called serpentinization, which are very high pH and rich, even, even higher concentrations of methane and hydrogen. So these are a completely different sort of chemistry um, than you typically see at the black smoker type of uh, magmatic systems. Uh, more moderate temperatures in the set sense, and typically where these things occur are not where places where uh, magmatic activity occurs, but these are associated with, um, commonly with uh, tectonic activity, earthquakes that offset the plates from one another and allow fluids to circulate. And then a uh, third type of system we work at are subaerial volcanoes. So in particular, we look at microbes that live within these volcanic fumaroles, and try to study how they're using all this, this gas that's coming out of these fumaroles. Um, these gases can include hydrogen, sulfur compounds, um, things that you might see in uh, sketches of what the early Earth might look like. Uh, these things are occurring right now in places like Kamchatka and Siberia and the Aleutian Islands and all along the Ring of Fire, really, uh, in the Pacific. So here you have uh, materials that accumulates on the ocean floor, then subducted um, back into the earth, and some of this makes its way back out through these extreme environments found in subaerial volcanoes. So uh, I just want to make a couple points about our studies of these sorts of systems. The first of which is organisms in these systems don't grow um, in your typical flask or beaker full of material. They don't, they don't grow in a liquid phase commonly. Um, these systems are dyna dynamic systems. Uh, if Nathaniel showed you some pictures uh, of his trip to Yellowstone this summer, he might show you uh, streamers and biofilms, uh, slimy communities growing in the outflow uh, from the hydrothermal pools there. Um, the organisms in these systems want to stay attached to surfaces. They want to stay in their, their uh, their happy place uh, in terms of these thermal and chemical gradients. And they grow uh, attached to these catalytic mineral surfaces. So many of the same surfaces and minerals we evoke to serve as catalysts in our abiogenic synthesis reactions are also the, the substrates for microbes to grow on. So here's an example of microbes that uh, grew on the surface of a piece of uh, iron sulfide or pyrite mineral that we stuck in a hydrothermal vent. Uh, you can see they, they form colonies, they divide, they disperse, and, and they uh, pattern themselves all over this surface. Uh, at the Lost City hydrothermal field, this serpentinization-influenced high pH system, um, there's also interesting insights from looking at biofilms. Uh, for example, when we go into the hydrothermal chimneys at the Lost City, we see almost a a uh, single species of biofilms comprised of archaea related to methanogenic archaea uh, within these hydrothermal vent chimneys. Uh, the picture uh, on the upper right here shows uh, some of the polymers, these polymeric matrix that holds these cells together. 
um, in this sense it's dehydrated, but these organisms are encapsulated together in, in a bed of slime more or less. They're, they, this uh, biofilms um, are held together and attached to the surfaces using polymers such as polysaccharides uh, which keep them in place. Um, so the point of this is, you know, not only do the organisms have some sort of very uh, tightly coupled interaction with the catalytic surfaces, but they grow as communities in these polymers and these, this polymeric matrix, this gel might serve some important roles in terms of thinking about how different organosynthesis reactions may couple together to form some of the first protocells. Uh, they may also serve as templates for minerals, uh, especially nanoparticles and uh, small scale minerals that may also serve as catalysts to occur. So these uh, charged, uh, these charged biofilms, these gel like matrices can, uh, can instigate the precipitation of small minerals. Uh, these minerals may serve as more effective catalysts when dispersed throughout the film. Uh, so this is another part where even you know, the properties of the, of the biofilm itself, even if they aren't cellular, may serve a role in uh, facilitating some of the uh, early prebiotic chemistry and organosynthesis reactions. So for, for one thing, I would encourage studying these small scale properties and the role of biofilms and polymers in origins of life research. Uh, second thing is it's very attractive to think about using uh, these metal sulfide catalysts or these uh, different uh, metallic catalysts to drive organosynthesis reactions. We can show that simple reactions occur fairly readily, especially as you heat them to higher temperatures and put them under pressure, um, such as the carbonyl insertion reaction shown um, in the middle here. We can also go out to hydrothermal systems like uh, the rainbow hydrothermal field in the middle of the Atlantic, which is a hybrid system between the high temperature and the ultramafic systems I've described and find many different organic molecules in the fluids coming out of these which have isotopic signatures and chemical signatures to show that they're they are not produced by biology. So we, get, we have both observational experimental uh, sense that uh, abiotic organic geochemistry is happening at modern day hydrothermal vents. Um, and it's, it's attractive to look at those uh, data and th then compare that to biochemical pathways that we know about, for example, the reductive acetyl-CoA pathway, and begin to plug and play with the different mineral catalysts and, and think about how the different steps may be catalyzed uh, through the reaction. But the reality of this, um, and sort of building upon what I was describing earlier about the divide between uh, living and non-living systems, are that there's the, the world is not that simple. There's overlapping carbon sources and properties in all of these systems. Uh, what we found through studies of deep earth materials and of hydrothermal systems is that organisms don't always use the simplest molecules to, uh, to metabolize. They don't always use the CO2 or the hydrogen. Sometimes they use some of these simple organic compounds produced by uh, abiotic processes. Sometimes they use the hydrocarbons, the methane, and other compounds. And so it's not always so clear as to what's biotic and abiotic in these systems. Certainly interesting to think about in terms of astrobiological exploration, right? We'd like to know, study these systems and understand what's, what's evidence of life and what's not. But um, as we're exploring deeper parts of, of the Earth's biosphere um, right now, it's, it's sometimes difficult to um, you know, go from a you know, very simple explanation like this to the complexity of the real world. Um, so again, I would encourage, encourage studies of these analog type systems in order to help us better define the properties of abiotic and biological carbon compounds in these systems. And then we haven't even gotten into the fact that we're covered with life on the surface and that complicates everything and eats a lot of carbon that's produced and uh, just makes it a big mess, right? Uh, and then thirdly, um, I want to talk about, you know, we've had this in biology, we've had this uh, genomics revolution over the past uh, 20 years or so where, um, you know, nowadays we don't have to deal with uh, uh, radioactive phosphorus in terms of our sequencing like Maxim and Gilbert and Sanger did uh, in those days. Nowadays we can just send uh, samples off on a plate and have results 
uh, overnight uh, or, or in very short order. Many orders of magnitude more DNA sequences um, than we used to. Uh, nowadays, we're drowning in data uh, in many cases. Uh, so this has really enabled us to look at biology in a whole new way. Um, so uh, an example of this is a really exciting paper that was published just this summer by Bill Martin's group over in Germany. Um, many of you have probably seen something like this tree of life in the upper right here, um, thinking about the lineages of bacteria and eukarya and archaea and how they might, how some last universal common ancestor may have been shared amongst these different lineages and, and thinking about what, what, uh, what that last common ancestor was and where it originated. Uh, many of these tr trees traditionally have built, been built upon just a few genes, primarily the uh, small subunit ribosomal RNA gene or 16S gene uh, that you may have heard about. But this genomics revolution I talked about has enabled us to look not just at individual genes but across whole genomes or uh, bacterial chromosomes uh, to look at the properties of not just the ribosomal RNA gene but any sort of uh, function or phenotype that we have some knowledge of. So, so Martin's group looked at over 2,000 different prokaryotic genomes um, from these sequencing analyses and boiled it down to 355 protein families that were shared amongst multiple lineages across the tree of life. And what they found out was that um, they, they found some clues to the metabolic and physiological properties of some that, that were likely shared by the last universal common ancestor. And that LUCA was probably an anaerobic thermophile, likely related to cluster DLEs or methanogens, and that things like hydrogen and nit nitrogen and carbon monoxide were all important in its metabolism. So some of these things sound familiar with what we've already described, places like the Lost City hydrothermal field or, or deep sea vents. So it's very um, encouraging that these sort of data were able to fall out of this very complicated and thorough analyses uh, that they conducted. And, but, but what Martin's group worked with was only a fraction of what, um, what is out there on the planet. So uh, there's, there's long been this significant disjoint between what we can obtain and, and domesticate in the lab, what we can culture, and what we know exists in the environment. Typically, we're only to, able to cultivate a very small percentage of all the organisms out there in nature, particularly in extreme environments that are not usually on the radar of, say, uh, you know, medical microbiologist, for example. So we have a very small subset of the organisms in nature in culture from these systems. But what we can do using these new genomic tools is to look at environmental genomes, to take DNA from the rocks, squeeze DNA out of the rocks or out of the, out of the sulfur and the fumaroles, and sequence all of the genes that are present there. And the interesting thing through my lab study of these systems um, is that many of the same metabolisms and properties that Martin's group uh, saw through their phylogenetic analysis uh, also fall out of these environmental genomes. So evidence for the role of hydrogen and CO and uh, carbon monoxide in these systems, for example the abundance of clostridia in these systems, which we suspect might be playing a role in, uh, in acetate production that can be utilized by other components of the community. Um, and so we've, we've done surveys of many of these systems for functional genes related to, uh, involved in carbon cycling and hydrogen cycling. Uh, shown here is a study from a site we work at in Northern California where ancient seafloor has arrived on the continents and thereby enabled us to study the subsurface uh, at the site. And so you can see numerous genes, or what is presented here is numerous, the abundance of numerous genes related to hydrogen cycling, uh, carbon cycling, and carbon fixation uh, present in these high pH sites where it's up to pH 12 uh, in terms of the solution. You can do phylogenetic analyses of some of these genes and uh, find, again, through these environmental genomic sequences that many of these genes related to hydrogen oxidation or to, um, or to carbon fixation come from organisms like methanogens or clostridia. Okay, so there's some really fascinating insights that are very um, complementary to uh, analyses of single organisms and their phylogeny to come out of environmental studies of these natural extreme environments. Uh, so I think there's a lot of insight to be had from looking from the top down 
at these systems, clues we can find in both the physiology and phylogeny of living organisms in these environments thought to be either analogs of early Earth environments or at least places where we can study the relationships between abiotic and biotic processes on the planet. And I think there's, in some cases, there's, I mean, as I mentioned before, we're, we're flooding in, flooded uh, with data in many cases, and so there's a lot to be mined out of these data sets that we haven't even um, happened upon yet. Uh, one of the studies in particular that I, um, I enjoy is the, uh, the looking at the metagenome, the environmental genome of of these single species biofilms from Lost City that we talked about earlier. So these org you know, this is like a single population of organism that grows within these chimneys that is bathed in pH 11 fluid at 90 degrees and um, really seems to be thriving in that system. And um, I already pointed out some of the roles of things like hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and methane in these systems, but you can look at things like transposases um, so genes involved in uh, gene duplication and replication within these biofilms. And what we found through the study of the Lost City chimneys is that something like 8% of the sequencing reads we found were associated with transposases. So uh, order of magnitude, more of the reads are associated with these gene duplications uh, than we'd seen in many other sorts of systems like farm soil and uh, bioreactor sludge and, and so on. So these. Hydrothermal vent chimneys in particular seem to be hotbeds for genetic exchange and, and diversification, even if on the surface they look like they're a clonal population of organisms. And since this study was published in 2009, other studies of sulfide chimneys have found similar, uh, the black smoker chimneys have found similar sorts of uh, relationships. And so what this means is that it's not just a single organism that has to have all of the properties to survive that the organisms within these biofilms can work collectively um, and potentially carry out multiple functions within the biofilm. So here's an example of looking at nitrogenases, uh, nitrogen fixation genes within these biofilms. And we can see that even though it looks homogeneous from the standpoint of a species in a traditional sense, we have something like 18 different nitrogenases present in the biofilm. So lots of uh, genetic diversity that's not immediately apparent. And, and then uh, additionally, I wanted to uh, point out that we, can, we should be able to train in with higher resolution on these systems and look at the relationships between the microbes growing as biofilms and the catalytic mineral surfaces. There's no reason we need to be carrying out experiments on organosynthesis at 300 degrees Celsius and high pressures uh, in the absence of biology and then train to grow our organisms at 100 degrees Celsius, we should be able to better replicate and study um, these systems and how they overlap uh, in space and time. Uh, and, and I'd like to finish up by saying I think there's a lot of potential to learn not just about how processes work on our own planet, but one of the best resources we have out there is by looking at these other planets and moons. Uh, looking at the potential subsurface ocean on Europa or the cryovolcanism and icy plumes coming out of Enceladus or the hydrocarbon lakes on the surface of Titan. So all these systems, whether they have biology emerging or not, should be very interesting comparisons um, from our own planetary neighborhood that ought to allow us to look back into deep time and to think about the conditions that led to the emergence of life on this planet versus in other locations. And with the addition of extrasolar planets to the menu, we have even more opportunities um, to, to consider and compare and, and maybe find uh, a, another uh, parallel life form existing out there. And so I'd like to finish by saying thank you and I'd be happy to take any questions. Sure. Sounds great. Let's see. That's you. That's me. That's you. Okay. I'll love myself over here. <laughs> yeah, you're all alone. There you go. <laughs> okay, is everyone ready for the pop quiz? <laughs> <laughs> um, great. Does anyone have questions for Matt just to begin? Uh, you mentioned that the carbon monoxide is in a critical molecule for the metabolic processes. 
Um, and uh, it's also a critical molecule for the prebiotic chemistry in right. the uh, primitive atmospheres. And uh, the question is that what is the energy source that basically creates the CO? This is a very probably important uh, question, how to create CO, which is available for those processes? Um, typically, as far as I understand it, the carbon monoxide is created by geologic processes. So it's um, produced by degassing uh, of earth materials, and, and it's a component of um, the, the fluids that are coming out of these systems. So, uh, so, I mean, that's my understanding, is the biology doesn't play a role in producing the CO. F several uh, electron volts, you know, to dissociate CO2, uh, and it's uh, actually it's not a small amount of energy. It's not a fraction of electron volts. It's more than that. Right. So, um, and the second question is that: Have you had the chance to look at the uh, how population uh, on those uh, films uh, um, changes uh, over some uh, time scale? Let's say that solar activity. I'm sorry, what was the last part of what you asked? Uh, like solar activity cycle, let's say over 11 years. Have you had the... Yeah, I mean, there's, there's been a number of interesting opportunities. I can point out just a few. Um, one of which is this single species biofilm at Lost City that I was talking about hasn't changed. That's what's been so interesting about that. Site after site we sample there, year after year, the same organisms exist within those chimneys. Um, so the, it really must be adapted um, to that environment. In fact, the only other place those organisms have been found is recently a similar system was discovered in New Caledonia at the Bay of Prani with hydrothermal chimneys like this, and the same organisms are all over those integrated within the carbonate chimneys there. So it's really interesting system um, in terms of its uniqueness as well as its, the resilience of those populations. At the same time, the black smoker chimneys are incredibly diverse and dynamic, so you've got um, meters per second hydrothermal, hydrothermal fluid circulating through those gradients that select for different organisms across those chimney walls. Um, so it's a very diverse system and very uh, subject to um, both uh, regular and episodic changes. So, I mean, volcanoes, magma moves around and volcanoes explode and uh, it's not a great long-term place to live uh, or just stay in the same place at the same time. I could just throw in there that uh, some of the scientists I've talked to, such as uh, Everett Schock from Arizona State, goes to Yellowstone and, um, and samples a, a set of 60 hydrothermal pools in a different, you know, a wide range of different kinds of conditions, alkaline and basic and hot and just warm and so forth. And he's doing just that, a longitudinal study. So he goes back and samples the same set of pools every year and is looking at those kinds of long-term temporal changes. So yeah, the, this is a, a very exciting ongoing area of research. And so, so your last comment actually feeds into the first question that I had um, in terms of tempo. I talked to, to Dr. Cleves before I came, and he said, you know, we don't know if this happened in a weekend, if these processes happened in a weekend, or if they happened in a million years, and you hadn't had to have a precise set or a precise sequence occur. So, so how, do we, how do we find that out in modern time? You know, or what signs do we look for um, either here or on a moon like Enceladus or Europa? <laughs> I, I mean, I think uh, it's a problem with many sorts of the experiments we do. Even with, if, if our question was something as tractable as let's try to grow some of these organisms we can't grow in the lab, the uh, issue we might face is the issue of time. It might be that the organisms divide once every 100 years or 300 years. And, uh, that's out of scale with our lifetimes, let alone a PhD student's uh, career. <laughs> so, um, so that's one problem we face anyhow, but uh, without knowing the sequence of events or, or even having a full list of all the events that need to occur, um, I think it would be very difficult to constrain that. In my opinion, the best approach might be to look at a variety of different analogs and get a sense at what those time scales might be. So we can look at remnants of the early Earth within our own solar system, where we can look at places that had similar materials but maybe didn't progress to having recognizable life. Anyhow, we have a lot of opportunities for observations to make that perhaps could feed into models to help us come up with experiments that a PhD student could actually do. Right, perfect.
Yeah, so one of the things that interests me as I go around and talk to these folks is, you know, the, the just that question of are we talking about a um, if you're if you're trying to reconstruct these early systems, you know how you get a living system from from rocks and seawater and 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 heat. Do you have, um, is it a gradual process of chemical uh, systems forming you know, s simple molecules and over time putting themselves together? Or do you build a, a system that is ready and then you pull the trigger and go? Right. Right? right. Uh, that, I mean, that's a really interesting question. Right, yeah. right here. Uh, thank you. Uh, when you talk about going from, say, an RNA world to an RNA protein world or something like that, uh, <clears throat> protein is basically a bunch of amino acids that get uh, tied together by some sort of uh, enzyme or RNA. And initially, you get a whole bunch of abiotic amino acids, but eventually, they've got to be synthesized. And has anybody looked at the mechanisms for synthesizing the amino acids and how they may have evolved and whether there are parallel different uh, mechanisms which could have originated separately? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm sure Matt has something to say about that, but uh, you know, among the people that I've been talking to, you know, when, as I look at and talk to different people working on the origin of life from, from different angles, um, you know, it, it seems to me that everybody has their, their own model and they, they, you know, they get so far down or so far up. And then at, at some point, everybody says, and then magic happens. <laughs> right, and 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 so I've started to think about this zone of magic, you know, and and what exactly is that, and kind of everybody zeroing, homing in on it somehow, and the, and and that right there, is to me, the the heart of the zone of magic, right? How do you get nucleotides associated with amino acids so that they are ordering them and polymerizing them into chains to build, to build things that, that actually do something, that catalyze further reactions, right? Um, so people are looking at that and trying to find out ways in which you can get, say, um, uh, uh, small, uh, small nu nucleotides, strings of nucleotides that can trigger um, a, a, a create a peptide bond and link two amino acids together, right? But creating the amino acids themselves. Creating the amino acids themselves. Those can fall out of things like the, uh, the acetyl coenzyme A pathway that, uh, that Matt described or the reverse uh, uh, TCA cycle, the, what we know is the, often called the Krebs cycle. Um, those, at different parts of those metabolic pathways, you can, the, you can produce both nucleotides and amino acids as well as, as lipids, yeah? Yeah, I, I, I think there are numerous sources of at least the amino acids themselves that could have fed into these models. It's the, this question of associating those amino acids into proteins and then relating that to to the RNA or DNA, whatever the molecule is that you're going to follow up on. Mm -hmm. And so that actually makes me think of a question that I had during uh, your talk, Nathaniel. Um, you, you mentioned how Gilbert went from seeing you know, spaces to modularity. And I was wondering, do you know anything about, or has your research shown anything about how that thought process happened for him? How do you go from, you know, d DNA or RNA or, you know, genes, which we typically think of as like words on a page, and if you're missing those words on the page, then how do you immediately think, oh, it, it must be. Yeah. Um, so as I say, this is ongoing, and I'm trying, I'm still, like, I got, a, a long email from Wally Gilbert uh, earlier this week that actually filled in several spaces for me. And you know, the, this idea of the, the exons floating on a sea of introns, right? That, that process, it, I've narrowed it down to somewhere probably during 1978. 
right? Wow. Um, and, uh, or, or late 77. And, and I'm still trying to get, the, the, the problem is that people construct their own narratives mm -hmm. of what happened. And as an oral historian, part of what, part of my job is to cut across those stories that they've been telling for so many years right. and, and get them to kind of break through and, and, and reconstruct their thought processes in a new way that's different from their kind of canonical narrative. Uh, I actually had to persuade one of the, one of the actors for Doolittle that this was uh, w one way of telling the RNA world story. And when, when I explained it to him, he said, yeah, that is a legitimate way of telling it, you know? Right. Uh, but he, he had bought the, and, and told the conventional story. Right, he had his yeah. own, uh, his own version, yeah. the version that you like to tell. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to just call on Mary, who I think wanted to jump in on that last point. Oh, sure. Yeah, maybe. I, I heard your question a little differently, and, and so I'm going to answer it slightly different in that it is very easy to make an amino acid. They're made all, in all sorts of different places. You don't need a cycle that's driven by a biological system and metabolism. Yeah. 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 We find amino acids all throughout basically our solar system and maybe the rest of the universe, we find them in meteorites that we are, no, are not biological, and you can get polymerization of them, not with a particular order, um, or not directed, I should say, as in the system, but mm -hmm. you can get small polypeptides. You can certainly get dipeptides and tripeptides without have, invoking anything, but you know, a, lot of, a lot of reactions and a lot of uh, biomolecule precur precursors are made without any biology involved in it. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, that kind of stems. Yeah, that he would have, yeah. And, and actually, as I said that, I, I realized that that's also a, an important answer. So thanks for chiming in on that. Yeah. Okay. And over here. I'm a little, bit, a little bit concerned that you keep bringing hydrothermal vents as opposed to geothermal vents. I thought we thoroughly buried them because any life appearing at hydrothermal vents would be diluted, kill, poisoned by sodium, and have no energy to survive. And these uh, Russell Martin bubbles have been just thoroughly refuted by a paper by Buzz Jackson in Journal of Molecular evolution from thermodyn purely thermodynamic point of view, which actually I argued 15 years ago. So what are your arguments in favor of hydrothermal as opposed to geothermal events? Thank you. Um, the, the point I was trying to get across was not necessarily an argument in favor of hydrothermal or even deep sea hydrothermal events. I, I actually was, have been very influenced by this idea of connected environments. It's, it's a near certainty meteorites uh, and their components were hitting the planet uh, early on and um, whether in many of these systems you're confronted with the same problems of dilution and trying to concentrate things on surfaces. So um, uh, one thing to recognize about these systems, whether it's a geothermal or hydrothermal system, is that they're a system in motion. So the the Con reaction conditions that synthesize molecules at 300 degrees Celsius or whatever don't stay in that place for, for any great length of time. In many cases, they move on to some other catalytic environment. Um, so I, what I favor is this idea of uh, connectivity between different types of systems. Uh, you know, I, I think going from observations of fluid circulations to a multifaceted model of bubbles and uh, you know particle formation is you know a few it's a few steps removed from what we observe in the natural systems but I think by studying the natural systems we can learn something about how these places actually function from a physical and chemical perspective. Do, do you think it makes sense to think instead of this idea of uh, of life popping out of the ocean or wherever some point, at some point, magical moment in time. Rather, the, the Earth becoming a biotic, a geobiotic system? I, I think at a global scale, that's likely, I mean, that's what's happened. That's where there's people and animals and bacteria yeah. and elephants. But, uh, but in terms of, uh, you know, it's, 
I think even locally, even within the scale of a few kilometers or you know, lar scales larger than individual protocells, connected processes likely played a role in this um, before the widespread takeover <laughs> of the planet. Yeah, okay. And so we'll take a handful of questions um, before we have to hop off the stage, right there. Yes, I'm uh, Ronald Wilson with the federal government. Uh, my question is uh, if uh, scientists ever uh, can firmly uh, establish the origin of life, uh, what do you see uh, as, as the uh, probable implications and significance of that uh, for humanity, mankind, society, in, a, in this universe, which probably will come to an end at some point in time? <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can probably come up with a scientific and a historical answer to that question. Uh, you want to go? An ethical. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, th I think it, from a scientific perspective, it will uh, open up all sorts of considerations in terms of the probability or possibility of life on these other planets and moons circulating other stars. So if, we, if, we, if it turns out to be highly likely, probable, um, then we might accelerate our efforts to learn if there's more life out there, um, or certainly have a whole different perspective on, uh, on our life, um, on the uniqueness or importance of, of our life on this planet. Um, but uh, in terms of, you know, there might also be, you know, other considerations with the, our ability to synthesize life out of nothing. Um, you know, what, what are the ethical considerations? Uh, you know, a lot of these same concerns are being met with synthetic biology and uh, genetic modification and, you know, sort of deconstructing cells. Um, so I think we need to also consider those uh, perspectives in, in this as well. And we will in the next session. Yeah. <laughs> um, I could just uh, chime in very briefly and say, you know, from a humanistic point of view, um, on one level, it's, it's a wonderfully sort of irrelevant question. It has, you know, it's not going to shape the outcome of the next election or anything like that. But on another level, there's no more interesting question, right? Uh, it, it, is, it is the question. And so it really would be morally profound if we could identify what that is. And part of what that would mean would be coming up with a definition of what we mean by the origin of life, right? And that, that in itself is a very fraught question. So a lot of scientists just, say, just sort of throw up their hands and say, never mind, I'm just studying the chemistry. But others say, well, how would you know if you found life unless you know what life is, you know? Um, and so there are important questions of humility, and our place in the universe, our, our responsibility, our stewardship uh, of the planet, our, whether we have the ability and the right to colonize uh, other, uh, other worlds, and things like that. So. Yeah, and I think I approach it from a, a place of you know, just pure curiosity. Um, how do you have, how do you have a world that has a mouse and an elephant, right? Like how did we get um, everything that's ever been created by an organism. You know, how did we get Facebook? How did we get Donald Trump? How did we get <laughs> Hillary Clinton, right? All of those things come from this singular question of, of how life started, so. And boy, would I like to know. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, right here? Yes. Uh, actually, I think we're gonna have to. Oh, we're gonna hang oh, okay. Wrap it up. Um, great, well, I would like to, to, to thank Nathaniel and also to thank Matt and, um, it's been a really fascinating discussion. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.